Thank you for listening to the BJJ Brick Podcast. We'll be bringing you Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and good times. We hope to flatten your Jiu-Jitsu learning curve, help you get the most out of your grappling ability, and meet your goals both on and off the mat. Welcome back, my friends. Episode 119 of the BJJ Brick Podcast. I'm Gary, and I'm here with my partner in crime, as always, Byron. How are you doing today, Byron? Gary, I'm doing great. Excited. Uh, another episode of Taboos. There's nothing better than Taboo episodes. Uh, uh, part two of our Tim, Slem, Tim Sled episode where we talk about uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu taboos. So uh, we've got a great show on tap, and you do not want to miss the interview. Yeah, these are topics you may not hear much about going into class. You know, you may not hear much about these online. People all times don't want to put themselves, um, you know, out there uh, with their opinions on these. But uh, Tim Sled steps up and he's uh, saying how he feels about these, and and we're going to share his expert lawyer like opinions about jujitsu. He's an expert at uh, you know, he's a uh, high ranking lawyer, uh, spent many years in that field, and he's bringing those uh, that knowledge and that skill base about uh, ethics. To uh, to his jiu jitsu world, which he's also an expert in, so uh, beautiful combination, uh, all in one one person to g- make a great episode about taboos. Yep. So, as I said before, do not miss this episode. You, you're going to love it. And if you did miss last week's episode, episode one eighteen, go back and check out check it out because uh, we do have uh, some other taboos listed. Uh, uh, he talks about in that episode. So, uh, just great, great episode. Uh, learn a lot of stuff and, uh, and just, uh, fun talking. You know, we're just, uh, just exploring these topics and, uh, uh, just talking about them and, and seeing where they go. Yeah. This is a, I would say it's a standalone episode and you don't need to listen to the first part to get the second part. But uh, if you missed the first part, what's wrong with you? Part one. The taboo. Yeah, the how, how dare you miss part <laughs> one? And then, if you do go back and listen to episode 118, we actually had a previous episode before that with Tim Sled. So you can't miss that one either. So uh, Tim Sled times three. Yeah. And that was, uh, I don't know if that was a year ago or so, but it was it was uh, at least four or five months back, if not a little bit more. And Because uh, you definitely don't want to miss episodes. And, and you know what I always tell my friends when they ask me, and this is what I get asked probably 30 or 40 times a week, Gary... How do I not miss any of these episodes? And the first thing I always tell them, get on our email list, my friend. Man. And, yeah. And basically, uh, just send us your email and, um, we have a little link for your email list. And send us your email. We will get you out a, uh, email every week, which will, uh, remind you that the show's on, uh, so you'll never miss another episode. And that way we can't talk about going back to previous episodes because you've already seen them. Listen to them. Yeah, we send out one email every week. We're not bombarding your email address with uh, a lot of ads and all this sort of of things like that. That's a lot of work, and uh, we already do a lot of work on the podcast, and that's more than enough for us. So how to support the show is we have an audio book that's for sale. It's $11.99, your first year of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu audio book. It's by uh, yours truly. Uh, It's about two and a half hours long. I'm going to talk to you about things like finding the right gym, your first month in Jiu-Jitsu, um, I hope you uh, avoid some of the, the cultural norms that you might break uh, that would get you uh, – make it a little bit more difficult starting jiu-jitsu. And uh, I also talk about a lot of the benefits of jiu-jitsu, not just learning jiu-jitsu. There's a ton of benefits, health benefits, uh, new friends, understanding how you your body works, understanding how you learn things. There's so many benefits of jiu-jitsu. I break down quite a few of them, and I think that knowing the benefits of jiu-jitsu helps you stay motivated in the long run. You're not just there uh, – Getting better at jiu-jitsu. There's a lot more going on with the with the class, and uh, I think that's a big one. Yep, your first year is your hardest year, and if we can help you through some of these roadblocks your first year, you can enjoy it that much more, progress that much more, and there's a better chance you're going to stick with it. And that's what we're here for. We're here to hope, help, and hope that everybody keeps training jiu-jitsu. We don't want people just to train, decide they don't like it. We, we want you to pass on. We want to pass on what we've learned to other people. We want you to pass it on to other people. And we just want to grow jujitsu. And that's what it's all about. Yep. And the, and the audiobook is eleven ninety nine. The, the The monies from that go to support the show and uh, help keep us on the air and help pay some of our costs and, and uh, help keep this thing going. So uh, that's much appreciated. Um, so... Any support for the show we really like. And if you can't buy the audiobook, let us know. Give us some support through email or something like that as well or our Facebook page. Gary, we've got a quote of the week. Our quote this week 
is similar to our topic with Tim Sled about um, taboos. You, you know, if you see something that you uh, would like to change, go for it. You know, take that responsibility. It's from Jim Jim Rohn. You must take personal responsibility. You cannot change the circumstances, the seasons, or the wind, but you can change yourself. That is something you have charge of. Uh, the the first part of this quote, you must take personal responsibility. That's something I think that in today's day and age, people are great at not doing. Um, we see, like, if you mess up and somebody else is involved, it's easy to, to, to say, well, it really wasn't all my fault. It really, you know, like, maybe you go to the tournament and you you get beat and you look at your team like, well, my team's not the best team in the world. You know, it's really not my fault. I, I'm not training with... Uh, you know, this person or that person, it's, man, it's, if I was, I'd do a lot better. Take responsibility for what's going on. And, and that's going to be the first, um, step towards getting uh, better results. You know, don't blame other people for your problems or, or anything that's going on in your life. Yeah. And then it's up to you to, to change any of that. If, if, like you were, let's go back to the analogy you were saying, hey, I lost to this tournament, but I'm blaming it on my team. I don't have the greater team. You know, first of all, take responsibility. Hey, I lost this match. It was me. Um, not like a meteor dropped out of the sky. I, I lost. He, he was better than me. You know, he was better than me on this day. And then, hey, what do I need to work on? Was my guard weak? Was my guard passing weak? Or was my takedowns weak? Was my arm bar defense not very good? And, and work on that. Take responsibility. Drill. Well, actually not drill. Challenge yourself to get better at that. Uh, you know, that's how I came in from last week's article about <laughs> drilling versus challenges. But really, work on work on what you want to change. Um, if it's jujitsu, work on some weak spots, or really, really get good at your bricks, your strong parts, and uh, and go out there and, and test yourself again. And hopefully, you have a better a better outcome. But if you don't, don't blame anybody but yourself. And and I think you hit it right on the head, Byron, when you said uh, a lot of people don't take personal responsibility. One of my favorite TV shows to watch is, is Cops. I love watching Cops. <laughs> I really do. I love watching Cops and uh, the first 48, and uh, which is another kind of like cop show where they try to solve a crime in the first 48 hours. But it always seems like, uh, you know, whenever they, the bad guy gets caught, always blame somebody else. It always has... It's always somebody else's fault that I pulled the trigger. It's somebody else's fault that I drove drunk. And uh, you just take the responsibility. You did the crime. Just, uh, you know, hey, I made a bad decision. Let's learn from it. Yeah, that's uh, – I'm not – I mean, I used to watch Cops quite a bit, and I think I, I've i I've been to a lot of these scenes. I'm a, I'm a firefighter, if you're new to the show. Um, and that's this is the way people are, like – these scenes are happening right now all over the world. Like police are dealing with people who are mad, mad at them, mad at other people, violent and, and things like that are going on. And it's just like seen on TV is not the same as seeing it in real life. And it's, and in real life, it's a frustrating thing. You know, people are, are not treating each other very well. And, uh, and, and so I've, I, since I've been on the fire department, I haven't really watched cops uh, very much. And, uh, I think it's changed me a little bit, but, uh, the people dodge responsibility and they, they do that all the time, um, work at home when the police show up, whatever. And, uh, it, it, it's, it's notice when people don't dodge responsibility, notice that person and recognize them. Uh, and, and, uh, just, just to make a little mental note that that person has taken responsibility for something that's probably a little painful. And, uh, and just keep that in mind about that person, which is a, it's a strong and increasingly rare personality trait. You know, I can tell you, uh, a couple of years ago, I was, uh, I was driving through my neighborhood, and uh, I stop at a stop sign. Well, actually, I didn't stop. I did a rolling stop through a stop sign. And as soon as I take off down the main street, I see some lights behind me. <laughs> and I was like, oh, boy, I'm caught. And so I pull over off the side and pull down a little alleyway. Um, and uh, the police officer gets out of the car, and he comes up to me, and he's like, hey, you know what you did wrong? I was like, yes, sir. You know, I apologize. I did not come to a complete stop. I, I know better, but uh, I made a dumb choice. And he looks me right in the eye and he's like, you know, I really appreciate you being honest. It doesn't happen very often. And I'm going to let you go with a warning. And uh, promise me you won't do it again. And and 
you know, that's what I tried to tell my son all the time is just to take responsibility for everything. And if you would have given me the ticket, I would have, I would have accepted it. It's, I mean, I don't have any choice. But, <laughs> I mean, I, I did it. I mean, I did it. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. I, I deserve to, uh, to pay that ticket. And, uh, some nice guy let me go. So I appreciate it, but I'm, I'm a big proponent of, uh, Always taking personal responsibility and, and telling the truth. Yeah, and, and but jokes on him, Gary. He did it again. <laughs> <laughs> Not for a little like, while, though, right, Gary? Not for yeah, we did at least uh, <laughs> two or three hours. I, I went to the next stop and then I peeled off my tires. And, oh man, uh, I thought this was gonna be the time when you uh, eluded police for three states and and, uh, <laughs> and switched out vehicles four times. Uh, that's a different story that for a different that's day, different. right, Carrie? Actually, Byron, please don't bring that up. With me. I could get in trouble. <laughs> okay, yeah, because nobody actually yeah. caught you on that one. Well, shh, shh, this is a uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> on the down low, that might be your new audio book. You know, a how-to book. Yeah, yeah. What happened to Jimmy Hoffa? <laughs> yeah. No, I'm just messing, Gary. Uh, <laughs> he's never been involved in a police chase. <laughs> So, uh, well, very law abiding citizen, uh, upstate member of the community. I admit to. There you go. Yeah, if they can't catch you, it didn't happen, right, Carrie? Yep. So. <laughs> hey, <we laughs> that's have a taboo. Us. Yeah, that's taboo. Another taboo. Life taboos. But, um, hey, we do have a special treat to dive into today. Um, we have our uh, special uh, article of the week. And it's actually on our BJJ Brick Facebook page. So uh, definitely uh, check it out there, but we'll put a uh, link to it. But um, the title of the article is More People Die from the Spoon Than the Knife. But the cool thing about this article is it's by our own Byron Jabara. Byron is now a published author. <laughs> Yeah, I'm trying to do an article a month, Gary, and uh, this is, I think, my second or third time in a row, so uh, yeah. I'm sticking with it. Yeah. But, you know, just going from the title, more people die from the spoon than the knife. Byron's not talking about prison with people who sharpen spoons oh, nice. and go straight for your jugular, because a lot of times those knives in prison are like butter knives, or, you know, they, they really can't kill that well, where the spoon, you know, because it's already oblong. You can sharpen that thing into a nice point, put some barbs on there. And, you know, like I've always said, if you're going to get somebody with a shank in prison, after you shank them, always make sure you break it off so it stays inside their body. And then take the handle and put it down the drain, the drain in the shower. Um, it's harder to find. But that's not what we're talking about. <laughs> wow, about. Gary. <laughs> Okay, that's not that's not quite the article I wrote. Yeah, that's not what we're talking about. But that's what some people might get from the from the uh, article. The yeah, title. a very uh, creepy picture on the website there. Yeah, it's uh, the Grim Reaper in his uh, gi, but you know what, <laughs> what belt he has. But more people die from the spoon than the knife. And basically, Byron talks about you know Brazilian Jiu Jitsu can't save your life in a fight. Um, it gives you techniques to protect yourself if somebody does try to harm you. And someday, Byron says you may be in a place you should not be, and and you may end up dealing with somebody who tends to harm harm you. And in that situation, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu can save your life. But as Byron goes on to point out, your odds of dying from a violent crime are less than one percent. Your odds of dying of of heart disease is. 23 and a half percent, you know, almost 24 percent, one out of, you know, every four deaths basically is due to heart disease. And you're getting that heart disease, like Byron's saying, from your spoon um, or I guess even your knife because you can spread butter on the stuff. But basically your spoon, <laughs> your, what you're eating is basically what he's saying. You have a better, you, you can really harm yourself, um, kill yourself from your eating habits. And one of the good things about jiu-jitsu is once you do start training, it seems like the once you start training, you, you kind of your a lot of your habits change. Uh, you try to become better at jiu-jitsu. One of the ways to become better is try to eat a little bit more, so or eat a little bit better. I mean, so <laughs> you're you're eating, uh, you know, hopefully better food, so you yeah. recover quicker, so you can get stronger, so your cardio is a little bit better. On top of that. Jiu-Jitsu is great exercise. You're exercising your heart. You're pushing blood through your body. You're losing weight. All that stuff is going to make your chances of having, you know, heart disease 
less. So, um, uh, you know, just a great article there, Byron. Well, thank you, Gary. And it's it, – I got inspired by this. My dad was talking about his dad, um, Harry Jabara, and he said, yeah, he would always say more people will die from the spoon than the knife, meaning that you're – you're, you're going to eat yourself uh, to death than you are to get stabbed in the back alley. You know, that's just – and and people don't really think about, um, you know, their daily eating habits as a deadly thing. But it, it does add up. And, and people often will fear, you know, getting attacked, which is a, it's an important fear to have. You know, it's a, you need to be cautious and, 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 and listen to your, your, your fears. But – it, less if you let, don't live in a bad neighborhood, less than one percent of the chances that you'll die from violent crime. I mean, it's clear what the bigger threat to your life is. It's it's the spoon or the knife if it has butter on it, like Gary says, like that. That's funny. So, yeah, I mean, you can use the, some people might not have it, <laughs> use their knife. To eat, but, yeah, but no, it's a you know it's a it's a pun on words basically, and, and I think it's awesome. I think it was a great quote from um, uh, Byron's grandfather there, Harry Jabara. But it is totally true. Um, your eating habits are a lot more likely to kill you than uh, somebody uh, in a dark alley. There we go. And we'll, we'll put a link to it, which is on our own website anyway. Um, actually, if you just go to the BJ Brick website and search for spoon, it'll pop right up. My knife might pull up a few more times, but uh, this, the word only spoon probably only appears once on our website. So uh, okay. that'll pull it right up. And it will be in the show notes for this in the email list if you want to find okay. it from there. Yep. And hey, what I was talking about earlier about uh, the shanking somebody in prison, <laughs> do not try that at home. No, you got to try that in prison only. Yep. And we don't have and a lot of prison. I wouldn't even attempt it in prison. Yeah, because that gets you more years, man. Yep. yep. More, more years. years. That's not Which, good. the more years you. You know, we've talked numerous times about how to get better at jujitsu. And one of the things is to stay consistent on the mat. And the bad thing is, if you're going to do more years in prison or in jail, that's the last time you get on the mat, so do not attempt that. There we go. Well, it's good. Words, to the, words. words of wisdom. There we go, Gary. As always, uh, Gary advising you not to stab people with a, with a sharpened spoon. Yep. But hey, speaking of, you know, because definitely stabbing people with a sharpened spoon is a taboo, I think it's time to uh, talk to Tim Sled here um, on part two of our Taboos of Jiu-Jitsu. Let's roll the interview. Diary of the World's Most Interesting Grappler. This is a reading from my diary. As I made my way to the North Pole, my goal was to find a place up there to train. For this is one of the few places on my map that I have never trained. Dear Diary, this is day 23 of my journey to the North Pole. This day turned out much better than I thought it was going to be. The polar bear has gotten closer than it has ever before. This scares my dog team. I I hope to get a chance to roll with this beast. I'm not sure of my type of attack, but if given the chance, I will most likely pull guard and promptly go for a wrist lock. I will keep my gi on in hopes that it will protect me from taking excessive damage from his claws. It feels good to have such a good plan and a potential grappling partner. I don't always listen to podcasts, but when I do, I prefer the BJJ Brick Podcast. Stay sweaty, my friends. All right, we've had a little bit of a break away. We're bringing back uh, Tim Sled for part two of the uh, taboo topics of jujitsu, and uh, this time we're lucky enough to have Gary on the phone with us as well. So this will be a, a, a good stuff. I hope to get uh, more educated on uh, on some of these taboo topics. Um, let's start off with uh, parents and kids uh, training jujitsu. Well, thanks for having me, having me back on to finish this up. I'm uh, I'm really excited. Parents and kids. So this is mostly going to uh, my perspective of this is mostly going to be toward. Uh, youth jiu-jitsu instructors and school owners because um, these are the people that are going to come into contact with what I think are the the uh, the problems that go on in a youth jiu-jitsu program and there and I offer a few uh, solutions so in my in my experience you have just as you have in let's say soccer or football or bas- youth basketball you're going to get parents that are living vicariously through their children. Um, you know, they uh, they want to see their child exceed some sort of expectation that they have. 
and that become that can become problematic. Um, you know, it's it's a hard dynamic in and of itself to try to coach a child while a, a parent is is watching on the sideline. Um, but when you have the parent who is um, investing part of themselves into the process, it becomes even more complicated. Add on top of that that business owners uh, and youth and in- youth instructors are you know trying to uh, uh, benefit financially, and it becomes very complicated. Um, so uh, the first the first problem is an is an easy one. Um, you have parents who are coaching from the sidelines when you're trying to be an instructor. Uh, that can be very easily quelled um, through posting uh, in your gym uh, notice that parents aren't to interact with the children when the children are on the mat and then letting the children know repeatedly and comfortably that when they step on the mat, the instructor or the professor, depending upon the level of the belt, is the one that they're to be giving their attention to. Uh, if it persists in its problem, sometimes it's a, it's a structural problem within the gymnasium. So, you know, uh, at my school, I have a small little lounge area where parents can sit and watch the kids' class. Uh, I know other schools that don't let parents sit and watch the kids' classes. Um, so if I were to have a persistent problem with, uh, you know, uh, the group dynamic, I would probably change it up so that the, the parents wouldn't be allowed to sit in there. But I, I also like the fact that parents get to see their kids do really well. They get to, they get to see their parents getting, uh, excuse me, get to see the kids getting positively reinforced, getting built up, not broken down. These are the components of my youth program. Um, you know, I do tease the children and, and, and we, we play game, games and nickname, but it's all in a very, very positive, uh, way. And the kids are always built up, even if they're not doing a technique perfectly. Uh, the part they are doing well gets highlighted. Um, you know, uh, any child coming into a martial arts school should feel proud when they walk off the mat. Um, and if they and if they've done something that, that they're not proud of, they should feel like they've gotten physically stronger. So if they weren't listening. They should feel like those burpees that they had to do are making them uh, a better, a better, uh, a better person. And uh, you know, I have I have a, a student of mine who, you know, his mind wanders through class, and he sometimes will be talking when I'm talking. And um, you know, he's since he's become one of my students, he's probably done oh 350 burpees. Um, but after every set, he and I talk about the value of those. You know, A, what did I expect from him that I didn't get that caused him to have to do the burpees? And then what did the burpees or the body weight squats or, uh, you know, the, the having to sit out when, when the rest of the kids are having, um, you know, sort of sparring time or something, what did that get him? And so we always talk about what the purpose was. And I don't get complaints from him about, when he when he knows he got busted, you know, sort of not paying attention, uh, you know, he he sees the value of, uh, the value in sort of the the sanction. I won't even call it a punishment; it's a sanction. A sanction doesn't necessarily have to be negative. Um, it, it has it tends to have to be something that's less desirable than the thing they could be doing, but uh, it doesn't have to be negative. It can actually result in a positive. Um, so the parents need to see that as well. The parents need to see that uh, that there's a that their their kids are 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 being dealt with in a way that's making them better. So that's why I'm an advocate for having uh, visibility of the class with the parents. With that, though, comes the problem of of uh, you know parents coaching or the kids kind of looking over and trying to see what the parent thinks of uh, the submission they just caught or. Um, you know, how they messed up or, you know, whatever it may be. And, you know, I, I try to have a pretty good relationship with the parents uh, and most of them I can approach and say, hey, no coaching today, you know, and uh, give them a little wink and they understand. Uh, the next sort of uh, parents and kids dynamic you get is the, the uh, insatiable parent, the parent that uh, you can't satisfy 
uh, what they want from your program. They're, they've got a child that they want to be a world champion. Um, uh, and you know, that their, their child isn't being challenged well enough or, or they're dissatisfied with the training partners you've put their child with. Um, the best thing for any instructor to do is just be cognizant that you're giving the best program you can to each child and that you're dealing with the children balanced and fairly. Uh, that way when the, when the, uh, the, when a parent comes up and says, you know, little Billy isn't, isn't, uh, why isn't little Billy rolling with Teddy more often? That's his best match. Well, you can just look the parent in the face and say, well, this is, uh, my program is very balanced and very organized. And the, the point is to make sure that all the students on this team, uh, reap a benefit. Uh, and, um, one of the best ways to sort of quell um, parents who are uh, very interested in their child getting special attention is to uh, to give them the price of private classes and say, "I welcome pri- I welcome uh, <laughs> your, your attendance in private classes." They stop asking after a while for special <laughs> attention, or they pay you a lot of money in privates, which is another benefit. But uh, par- parents and kids are are. Um, are an interesting struggle for a jiu-jitsu school, uh, uh, instructors within the school and the school owners themselves. However, uh, with the right approach, with a balance of saying, uh, we have a program, we believe in the program and, uh, your child's best interests are at our, uh, are on the tops of our minds at every time. And that's really all the parents can ask for. And, uh, uh, helping kids build confidence, build physical strength, build, build mental toughness, uh, learn great technique, um, and have fun, you know, make friends. We, we're, my goal is that with every child that comes in, they're going to do jujitsu when they're my age. So, you know, I don't want to burn them out through just over competition, you know, over stimulus. Uh, but I also don't want them to, uh, think that it's just dodgeball and, uh, and that they, they don't see a difference between this and, and soccer. They've got to see that there's something different. Yeah, Tim, I was wondering, uh, kind of what you think. Like, today, jujitsu hasn't been around that long, so the majority of the parents, I bet, probably have not trained versus, mm-hmm. you know, a, a soccer mom where everybody, a soccer dad, everybody's played soccer and, you know, they've all played. So, I'm wondering, as time goes on, you know, let's say another 10 years, I think we'll probably see more parents who have trained get their kids into it. And I'm wondering if you're going to see less of the fanatical kids just because the the parent has been there, has trained, knows how hard it is to get on the mat and, uh, you know, take a beating sometimes. I just wonder if if that's going to change anything with time coming, coming up. The only thing I can do is I can, I can look at other examples from other things. So, um, you know, say look at, look at football, look at baseball, look at soccer. Um, uh, those things have been around for a lot longer than, uh, the youth Brazilian Jiu Jitsu programs in the United States and you still get parents that, that misbehave and, and, uh, uh, live vicariously. You know, it's, it's the, it's the, the guy who was not able to be the starting quarterback uh, for his football team that, you know, drives his son batty trying to get his son to be the varsity quarterback on his football team. And, uh, so, you know, I think, I think that probably the same problem will exist with jujitsu. Um, uh, the ultimately, uh, my hope is, is that jujitsu humbles a person more than say football, more than say basketball or soccer, that it humbles True. a person enough that they will say, uh, there's a, there's enough stress and strain on a jiu-jitsu student. Uh, the parent doesn't need to be that. And, um, you know, the goal is get the child to black belt, not get the child to, you know, the gray white belt. Um, uh, and, uh, so I would hope that, that jiu-jitsu would offer that. And I think in the right environment, um, uh, it, it should that should be the perspective is, and, and I say it, uh, in my gym, uh, during my mat chats, uh, I'm not looking to make a bunch of blue belts. If I have a, if I have a room full of white belts, my goal isn't to make uh, a bunch of blue belts. My goal is to make black belts. And so, 
you know, I, I'm teaching a curriculum in a specific way with a specific emphasis to get the kid, get the, the adults to the next level. Nothing is different for me with the, the kids. Um, my goal is to, to have, uh, you know, the, of the 18 kids that I have right now, I want 18 black belts someday to say, I started with Tim at Small Axe and, you know, that's where I got my arm bar from or that's where I got my, my leg squeeze sweep from. And, you know, that's how, you know, my, my longevity, my eternal life in jujitsu, uh, that's what I'm hoping to do is instill that stuff. You know, I die when their jujitsu dies, you know, so I want them to, I want them to keep doing jujitsu forever so that, you know, my, my energy that I've put into them, uh, goes on as well. So it seems like the biggest problem with, with the kids and, and their parents, the parents trying to live through the kids and try to get something out of that to feel like they've accomplished something that, that their kid is accomplishing. And, and this is present in jujitsu. I mean, obviously, but jujitsu is, is a, you know, a grappling sport where even if a parent's a little bit overexcited, um, what the kid's dealing with is another kid who is grappling. Um, <clears throat> How would this transition to like the parent wanting the kid to, to do MMA? Well, um, at my school, if a parent came to me and said, um, I want, you know, I want Billy or I want Susie, uh, to do mixed martial arts, I would strongly discourage it. Um, there, uh, I don't believe there's any place, uh, for, Youth, and by youth, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put, a, I'm gonna put some parameters on this. I would say 15 and younger. Uh, there is no place in mixed martial arts for 15 and under. Um, I believe that there is a place in kickboxing for kids who are under the age of 15. I think there's a place in, in judo, in wrestling, uh, in Brazilian jiu jitsu. Uh, but I think when you mix all of those things together in, in the thing that is called MMA, it becomes too disorganized and too dangerous for, for the children. Um, uh, I just, it's, it's, it's just a firm opinion I have. I would rather see, and I think it's better for a kid that has an aspiration to be an ultimate fighting champion um, to say, okay, these are the component parts of being an ultimate fighting champion. You need to be, a, you need to have striking, you need to have clinch and throwing and takedowns, uh, whether that be judo or wrestling or both. You need to have ground submissions, um, and you need to be in, in great strength and conditioning. Let's work on becoming as sharp at all of those as we can that way when you when you build up the body the frame the maturity uh to get into a situation where you can use all of those tools at the same time or in the same occurrence uh it, it would be it'll be more healthy it's um you don't drop a um uh, you don't drop a 9 year old into a college level lit class Literature class. Uh, you draw. You, you put a you put a nine year old through uh, basic grammar. You put a nine year old through um, uh, chapter books, so they start learning basic grammar. They're, they're reading chapter book books. Um, they're learning vocabulary and spelling. Uh, all so that when they get to the the college level and they take a, a literature course, they can read something that isn't even. You know, it, it can be English, but it wouldn't even be uh, sort of modern colloquial English, and they will be able to understand it and actually gain value from reading it. Uh, let's say uh, uh, Charles Dickens or something like that. Um, uh, the, even though the words aren't sort of in their normal use today, a the, the college level student will be able to, to thrive and find value from it. But a nine year old would just it'd be like reading gibberish. And I think that that's kind of what I view mixed martial arts as being. Uh, I believe it is a a wonderful activity for uh, a mature person who wants to engage in 
a very very complex uh, situation. Um, I think I think it, a sport. It's a complex sport, is what it is. It's not. Uh, it's nothing more than that. Um, but you've you've got to be able to. Uh, I think for kids who are interested in doing it, I don't think it's wise to put them through um, and into that complex situation until they've mastered some other areas. And I think they'll gain far more from wrestling, far more from judo and kickboxing and jujitsu uh, than they would from sort of an MMA class. Uh, and, and I'm sure people will disagree with me on that, but uh, I think the college – uh, you know, or maybe even use maybe even use college calculus as as a better example, uh, where you're using all the fundamentals you get from uh, uh, rudimentary arithmetic uh, to get to a, a solution to a problem that's very complex. That's what I view mixed martial arts as. How do you look at the the parent that is that has this as an idea versus if the, if the kid is 15, 16, 17? I don't know. I don't know the the age of the the correct age for a kid to possibly do MMA, but if the parents like pushing that, is that a what, what does that what does that tell you? Well, I, I definitely would have some concerns about it. Uh, I mean, if especially if the child doesn't want to do it, if 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 the uh, if the child is saying, "Man, I I just want to I just want to wrestle or I just want to do jujitsu," but dad wants me, you know, wants to put me in this smoker next week. Um, uh, with some other kids, you know, I would, I would, I would look the parent right in the face and say, "What are you hoping to gain?" Um, uh, you know, you're, you're, you've got a handsome kid, or you've got a, you've got a beautiful daughter, whatever they are, uh, and you are going to, and they've chosen to train martial arts, but you're going to put them in something that they're not prepared for. Uh, why would, why would you do that? Um, I, I would. Uh, oh, because, well, maybe the parent says, "Oh, well, because you know, I know they're tough enough, and this will be just what they need to see, do, so that they can see, you know, if they need to work on other stuff." Um, well, we could we can go that route, or you can just have them roll with me. Uh, I'll I'll, <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll I'll be a thirty eight year old black belt on top of them, and we'll see we'll see what they think. But uh, I don't I I just you know, there's this. There's so many bad things that can happen for a, to a kid inside of inside of a cage. Period. I mean, you just you just put you just phrase it like that inside of a cage. Um, it would, it, putting a kid inside of a cage just to me doesn't uh, doesn't jibe with my my reality. Uh, Tim, I know we're talking about uh, taboos um, in jujitsu mm-hmm. and. Um, you're talking about, you know, putting the kid inside the cage and, you know, we're talking about, uh, MMA. If it, it can be disorganized and very dangerous. And it brings up another topic I've been seeing here a lot lately about, uh, uh, fake black belt instructors and, uh, you know, uh, not being qualified to teach. And, and that's another thing I, as I think of being, uh, dangerous to a student there. Absolutely. Uh, there's, you know, that's, that's one of the, one of the fantastic things about being on this uh, at this at this stage in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is that it's still a relatively small community. Um, I remember when I was a blue belt, my brother in law Andy asked me how many black belts there were in the country, and uh, with pretty good ease, I could count and say the names of most of them. Uh, I'm sure I missed some there that I didn't know about, but, um, you know, there's been, a, there's been sort of a, a ground swell, uh, as, uh, you know, as we get 18, 19, 20, 22 years into having, um, uh, good jujitsu programs throughout the country, you're starting to see a lot of, uh, uh, Brazilian jujitsu black belts pop up. But it's still a small community. The, the the lineage tree is still pretty easy to say, hey, who'd you get your black belt from? Oh, I got my black belt from Hinato Tavares. Oh yeah, Hinato Tavares is awesome. Great guy. He doesn't hand out belts. He's he's got a great curriculum. He's a good instructor. He's uh he's been around the block. He's created black belts that are well known. Uh, you know, and uh, or, you know, who'd you, somebody asked me, who did you get your black belt from? Oh, I got my black belt from Andre Galvao. 
Oh wow, yeah, he's he's he just won ADCC. Yeah, yeah, I got my black belt from him a long time ago, and been training with him since. And you know, so people, it's pretty easy to sort of check lineage. Uh, still, at some point, it won't be. Uh, you know, say when one of my black belts, let's say uh, in a few years, I get a black belt uh, that I ha- I hand somebody a black belt. And then that guy gets enough time under his belt that he makes a black belt. Well, a person may come into their school and say, well, who did you get your black belt from? I got it from so-and-so. Who got it from so-and-so? Who got it from Tim? Who got it from Professor Andre? And so there's going to be a point where the lineage becomes harder to see and harder to, to sort of fact check. Um, however, there are some clear tells uh, and before I get into some of the clear tells, um, uh, uh, this is this is a good point. There are legitimate black belts out there that have no duty teaching Brazilian Jiu Jitsu to people, um, and then you know there are people who are far less than black belt, purple belts, let's say, who uh, are fantastic Jiu Jitsu instructors. Um, the point is they just have to keep their 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 rank as as honest as they possibly can. So, having said that, a fake black belt, somebody who you um, uh, you walk into their school as a parent or as a, a visitor into a community, and uh, you 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 want to check out their their gym, and you see, oh, they've got a a jiu-jitsu program and they spell it J-I-U, J-I-T-S-U. And so you're like, ah, it's a Brazilian jiu-jitsu school. One of the first things that you should be able to do either on their website or on their wall in their gym is you should be able to see who they got their black belt from. Uh, you know, if, if you can't, if that's not present, a red flag should be going off. If they, if they don't announce who they got their black belt from, then that's that's a that's a red flag. Um, the next thing that you should be noticing is that they follow sort of the the cultural norms of a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu gym in the sense that you know they're not wearing socks on the mat, they're not wearing <laughs> wrestling shoes on the mat. Even though I know uh, a fantastic Brazilian Jiu Jitsu legend who does wear wrestling shoes sometimes when he trains. Uh, it, it's, it's typically not a, uh, a cultural norm. Um, a typical Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt will have uh, a gi program. So if they're not, if they don't have a gi program and they're not Tenth Planet, then something's amiss. Um, you know, very few uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belts who are operating quote Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu programs end quote. Uh, uh, most most of those uh, uh, will have a gi program. Uh, it, so if this person says we teach Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, but they don't have a gi program and they're not sort of Chris Brennan or Tenth Planet, then they're abnormal. They're, that's some, that's a that's another red flag. You need to sort of why are they hiding from the gi? Why are they not wearing the gi? Um, uh, and uh, and there's there's sort of uh, there's there's easy ways to check into this. So when you find a black belt, what should you uh, a fake black belt? What should you do? Um, well, definitely don't give them your business. Uh, that's that's the best thing not to do. Uh, find another gym that you can give your business to with a legitimate black belt. Um, you know, I often I often say to people that to get a black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is is very much equivalent to getting a higher education degree. By the time somebody's invested the time that it takes to get a black belt and the money that it takes to get a black belt they've put a lot of work and effort into that black belt and uh, you know they deserve uh, your business versus sort of going to the the guy down the street who you know isn't legitimate so uh, if, if you're really interested in learning Brazilian jiu Jitsu uh, seek out the best instruction you can get uh, if you if the best instructor you can get is, is a, a black belt, you know, uh, make sure you, 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 you give to them your, your business. Once you've done that, uh, make sure they know that there's somebody in town, um, that's posing as a black belt 
and then leave it at that. Let the let the school academy owners in the area uh, do their own sort of uh, peer review and business check. Uh, a lot of people go online and post videos or, or post on, on YouTube threads. Uh, is this person real? Is this person not real? Is this a legit black belt? Um, and, you know, I, I would imagine that most people that go on the underground and say, is this guy a legit black belt? You know, most of those guys are, are lower than black belt. And, um, you know, sometimes it, it's a witch hunt and sometimes it's the real deal. Um, but the point is, um, make sure people aren't being fooled. But at the same time, uh, hopefully you're busy enough in your everyday life that, that you don't have to sort of spend your whole time dealing with somebody, some, somebody else's lie, feeding yeah. somebody else's lie. Um, and the best thing you can do is support a legitimate program. Let that legitimate program owner in that area know that there's a fake out there. And then that, that's really the business of the business owner. If, 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 if I had somebody open up a gym down the, down the street from me who was a fake, uh, who was, let's say, a, a Japanese jiu-jitsu black belt, but he was posing as a BJJ black belt, um, I would hope that one of my students would tell me, and then I would take care of it. I would take care of it through you know, introducing myself to the guy. I would take, my, I would take care of it and checking through that guy's lineage, cross-checking any sort of – you know, let's say he said he's a, a Huron Gracie student. You know, I would I would contact Huron Gracie and I would say, Hey, do you know this guy? He's claiming to be a black belt, but you know, something's amiss. He doesn't have your sticker on his on his on his car, he doesn't have you know, he, he's not he's not claiming to be your an affiliate, uh, uh, but he says he's trained with you and he's wearing a BJJ black belt and I know a lot of guys who've gotten black belts from you and you know, none of these guys seem to know him. So I would do a cross check that way, and uh, then if the guy's a complete fraud and trying to steal people's money, then I'll put him on blast somehow. But I'm a gym owner in that area who has a business interest in that, uh, you know. So that I think that's a, a fair thing to have happen uh, if you've got somebody that's selling selling uh, a shoddy product in your area, uh, and you've got a better product is to so put put everybody on notice. Um, uh, it, it, it surprises me. I, I worry about the mental health of somebody who uh, um, claims to be something that they are not. Uh, in, in that sense, you know, in a, in a black belt sense, there's there's a there's a whole group of these guys that go around claiming to be uh, military. These stolen valor idiots. Um, uh, I, I, there's something there's something really wrong if you have to create a false history. Um, to derive value in yourself. And so I don't want students out there to, uh, to surround themselves with that sort of person. And, and if you find that sort of a person and you focus too much on them, uh, it's just negativity. Don't feed yourself on that negativity. Go to somebody real, figure out, you know, there, there's too many good people out there. To, to sort of spend time and energy and, and the the limited number of minutes we get to live uh, focusing on a fraud. Uh, let uh, Expose the fraud to the people that can take care of it or who are actually affected by it, who would be the school owners, and let them address it. You've given uh, uh, advice for different people in this situation. Um, a, a new person – Coming in, you gave some good advice about checking things online and, and seeing what's what's posted, seeing their lineage, and trying to figure that out. Um, as as somebody who might just, I might go to Happy Town, Kansas, and 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 roll for a day, and then go back home, and and I hey, there's a gym there, and and this oh, there's a black belt here. I didn't know that. And if if this person is obviously not a real. I, I, it's hard to draw the line of, of of calling somebody out. Like if they're clearly not even a purple belt level, I know they're not a black belt. You know what I mean? Like there, right. there are some black belts that may not roll all that well, but they get, like you said, some people teach really well, and that's 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 have a tremendous value. But um, as somebody who maybe travels into town for a day, sees somebody who's clearly not what they're selling. Um, you just recommend telling the closest gym that seems real <laughs> about this situation and then, then deal with the dirty work of, of kind of getting it out there and seeing what's going on? It's, it's really tough. Um, first off, 
I've never had the experience of, and I've trained all over the country and I've trained in multiple places in the world. Yeah. I've, ne- I've never had the experience of walking into a gym where somebody had a black belt on, rolling with them and not feeling like they were a black, that they were a black belt or at least a brown belt that earned their black belt somehow. Um, I have had a guy walk into my, gym, um, uh, who wasn't following some of the cultural norms of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, but had a black belt with a red tab on it, claimed to be a BJJ black belt, rolled like a blue belt, uh, a, like a new blue belt, lots of, lots of silly mistakes, uh, was trying to play a lot of advanced modern style Jiu Jitsu, but was super ineffective. Um, and, uh, basically, you know, I, 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 I asked, you know, I was very polite. I asked who he got his belts from. I didn't recognize the names. So needless to say about our third role, um, I, I, I gave him a black belt role. You know, I, I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't show, you know, sort of, um, compassion. I, I rolled like a black belt and, um, as if he was a black belt, I didn't let him play. I, I, I did, I ran game. And then I, I had another black belt buddy who was in the gym at the same time, handed handed this guy off to him. Um, that guy walks out the door. He was a visitor. He was just in town on vacation. Uh, you know, we, we sort of were like, what in the world? Who is this? And uh, we looked him up and, you know, tried to track him, track him back. He doesn't have anything online, no Facebook, no uh, – you know, no Instagram, no, uh, I couldn't find, I, I tried to remember some of the names of people that he came up under, couldn't really find any. So somewhere out there, uh, there's a guy, you know, walking around with a, <laughs> uh, a black belt, but the, the, the best thing, the best thing I can tell you is that he walked out of my gym, but he felt us. Uh, he knows what black belts feel like. And, uh, and the two black belts that were there, me and this other guy, we aren't, we aren't world champions so to to take the whipping he took from us uh, he's got to know that you know he didn't yes he walked into an auto school but he didn't get like he did, he wasn't down at headquarters where you know there's purple belt world champions that would have done him worse than what we did and so uh he knows the truth and uh i don't it's it's tough i've never i've never gone anywhere stepped on a mat trained with a black belt and not thought, man, that guy had some good jujitsu or it was at least brown belt level and, you know, probably a black belt level instructor. I mean, I've, um, so it, it's tough. Um, and then, and, and like you said, I don't, I really don't know how much of it is, is my business, you know, um, especially if I don't live in a community. If I, let's say I went to Happyville, Kansas and, you know, I'm, I'm there for a, a festival or something and I want to train. I take my gi and I see there's a, a Taekwondo school that has a jujitsu program and the jujitsu program says to have a black belt. And, you know, I go in there and the guy's a fraud. You know, it's, it, I don't know how much of it's my business sort of to put him on blast when I leave town. Um, you know, I think there's a, a few factors. If he's claiming to be somebody's black belt, uh, and that's just a straight up lie. I think I then have a duty to notify that somebody, you know, like, let's say it's a, you know, I'm just going to throw a random name on. Let's say somebody claims to be like a Pedro Sauer black belt. Yeah. And the guy, and the guy has zero jujitsu. I mean, like the guy's horrible. He's like a blue belt. I mean, I would, I would contact the people that I know in Pedro Sauer's association. I'd be like, look, Hey, in happy, Happyville, Kansas, there's a real tool, you know, wearing a black belt by you guys. Um, I know you guys. I know black belts under Pedro Sauer that are like some of the best instructors in the world and some of the, some great jiu-jitsu guys. So, what's up with this cat? Uh, did he get did he get his head hit? Uh, is he you know has he been significantly injured in his life? What's going on? And I might put him on blast that way, and then let the people at that association know. But if the, if I can't track the guy's lineage, like if he's just complete fraud BS, then it's sort of caveat emptor at that point for other people that. If you can't check, if the guy's lineage doesn't check out, there isn't a lineage. Um, you know, it's you, you, you gotta, you gotta beware. Uh, but if he's, if he's lying about his lineage, he says he's, let's say he says he's Robert Drysdale's black belt. 
well, you know, Robert Drysdale's black belts are killers. I mean, these are, these are tough guys that know great jujitsu. So it would be abnormal for there to be, uh, a, a Drysdale black belt that doesn't have like superior quality grappling. So, uh, you know, same thing with like Professor Andre. If some guy says, ah, I'm Professor, I'm a Andre Galval black belt. Well, first off, I know every single one. So uh, that guy's going to go on blast fast, but you know, uh, uh, yeah, it's yuck. Let's not talk about fake black. Belt <laughs> yeah, let's 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 yeah, no more fake. That's black taboo. Belt. <laughs> that's that's too taboo. Let's move on. Yes. Yep. Hey, speaking of taboo, but uh, really, it's now becoming so common. Um, but back in the day, you always heard taboo leg locks. Uh, you know, one of the things, and like to get your opinion. You know, when's a when's a good time to start training leg locks? Start uh, incorporating them into your game. The best answer I can uh, that I I think I've ever heard for that question is start training them one level before they're legal in a tournament. Um, uh, so for, for competitive purposes, um, uh, in and I'm talking about. Gi Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Uh, you, st- you should start training a, tech- a technique one level before it becomes legal in a tournament. You don't want to be a uh, a uh, a purple belt who doesn't know the figure four toe hold, and then jump into a brown belt match where the figure four toe hold is now suddenly legal, and you're completely uh, uh, unfamiliar with the setups, the grips. The attacks a person's going to do. That being said, it takes a really, really good coach to say, okay, this is legal in our gym, but not legal in a tournament. So competitor as a purple belt, you can do a figure four toe hold, uh, in the gym, but when you got to turn it off when you go into competition, that takes a, that takes a, a, a good coach. Uh, on, on a more sort of, so leg locks, let's, let's classify leg locks. First you have, in my opinion, you have the straight Achilles Foot lock, the uh, sort of the bread and butter uh, leg lock. Um, uh, you know that leg lock doesn't frighten me at all. Uh, it's a it's a it's a great submission technique. It uh, allows a person ample opportunity to submit. Um, it's actually relatively te- technically hard to tap somebody with it, um, so you need to have. Really, really good technique to do it. Uh, if you have bad technique, all it does is it basically uh, becomes like a calf slicer and uh, a pain technique, a pain compliance technique. Um, uh, you have so you have uh, straight ankle locks. You uh, staying out on that that portion of the limb. You then have a heel hook, which in uh, gi Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is a very frowned upon technique because of its danger. And the heel hook is a very, very dangerous technique. Uh, the pain from the heel hook does not begin until after damage, significant and uh, long-term damage has been done. Uh, the escapes to heel hook are um, directionally sensitive. You have to, uh, you have a fifty. You have two choices: turn one way or turn the other. Uh, and if you turn the wrong way, you do significantly more damage to yourself. You actually help the submission. If you turn the a correct way, you have a chance to escape. That chance to escape is uh, um, uh, either helped or hindered by a couple variables, one of which is uh, the cloth. Cloth hinders your escape. So in gi jiu-jitsu, uh, you have to A, turn the right way, and B, hope that your cloth doesn't impede your ability to turn, uh, and finally, C, you have to be in the process and will and willing to tap because you're not going to feel the pain of it until after you're injured. So heel hooks are are something that I I don't allow them in my gi program at all. Um, and there's going to be a lot of people that disagree with that and say, oh my gosh, you're taking out a fantastic submission from uh, the submission grappling scene and – uh, your students are going to be the worst for it. Um, and I will quote my first black belt professor. He's now a coral belt named Kaiki. Uh, and, and his, his words were, if you can heel hook me, I can eye gouge you. Uh, they're both fighting <laughs> techniques that do significant damage. 
uh, yes, they're, they're fight moves. They are jujitsu. They are, um, you know, um, uh, techniques that can end a fight. And, but at the same time, there have to be boundaries someplace. Uh, and if you have a jujitsu environment where there are no boundaries, and that's clearly stated and everybody acquiesces and you've got appropriate waivers and enough student bodies to fill in as the other ones drop out, then go for it. Let everything be legal um, and have that be your your vibe. But that won't be a vibe for me at my gyms because my goal is to have people doing jiu-jitsu forever, you know, not just – you know, not, not just when they're full of uh, piss and vinegar as, you know, 18, 19, 20 through 29 year olds. Um, I want guys uh, who are going to do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu forever. If they're going to train for an event where heel hooks are legal, um, you know, I will teach them what I know. And if I can't teach them something or I don't know something, I know plenty of guys that can. But uh, it's my opinion that in the uniform, a heel hook is uh, almost an instant tap. You've got to tap almost instantly because the, the danger is just too large. Uh, you know, taking six months off the mat is an expensive cost uh, for me as an instructor or for me as a business owner if one of my students has to take that six months off to get their ACL repaired. Um, you know, it's, it's just – it's an unnecessary thing. It's like – it's much like eye gouging. Or, uh, you know, uh, or, or, you know, something along those lines. Uh, so, you know, um, it, so that's, that's not, so heel hooks aren't, aren't good in my opinion. I think that when do you teach heel hooks? You teach them in private classes, uh, to people who are, uh, um, uh, infatuated with them for some reason. Uh, you, you do it in a very safe and controlled environment. You set clear rules on when and how they can use those. Um, and then, uh, so that's how, that's when, when to, when to teach and do leg, uh, uh, heel hooks, which are illegal in the gi, in almost every gi tournament that I, that I know of, they're illegal. Um, so my rule of teach them one level before they're legal means don't teach them. But, um, there's an exception. Knee bars, uh, I like knee bars. Uh, I use knee bars. I've been tapped with knee bars. Uh, again, uh, I think one level before they're legal. Uh, I don't think you teach a white belt uh, a knee bar because white belts some, some white belts don't even have balance yet. And uh, and if you throw your whole body onto a knee, uh, you don't even you may not even intend on extending the leg, but y- your weight drops badly. You, you pull wrong. And you don't give the guy time to tap, and there you go. You've ruined a guy's leg, and uh, it's bad news. Uh, figure four toe holds. Um, you know, I think I think they are an okay technique. I actually got hurt with a figure four toe hold uh, in July. Uh, a very very good purple belt that trains with me uh, was using fantastic technique. He, I had ample time to submit. Uh, I knew I was caught. I tried to boot my foot and make a make it. I try to do every defense that you're supposed to do in the book. Um, I was being a little lazy, and when the when the student applied the right amount of pressure, my 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 the tendons in my foot popped, uh, and nothing. He did not do anything wrong. He was perfectly competent and uh, executed the technique with absolute control. But even I, as a black belt, didn't give that technique enough respect, and was injured for a while. I mean, I had to, I had to tape my foot for a long time. It, it made it so I couldn't do a competition that I planned on doing this year. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's, it's not a technique that I show white belts because, you know, a lot of times a white belt will catch a foot and, you know, especially if they catch a blue belt and it becomes, Oh, I'm going to get the blue belt to tap. And next thing you know, you got an injured blue belt, uh, or, or you got a guy who, cranks on a, a blue belt's foot and it, the blue belt uh, you know gets out of it somehow but now the white belt's got to face the wrath of a, of a very irritable blue belt who grabs the foot and knows the technique better and then pops the foot so um, it's a it's a uh, uh, foot locks or uh, figure four toe holds are fine uh, I, I think that they are a uh, I was actually happy when the IBJJF moved that move high. it used to be a blue belt legal move and now it's a brown belt legal move 
Uh, I was glad when they moved it up the chain a little bit because I, I do think it's a move of maturity. I think uh, both the person caught and the person catching it have to have maturity uh, in, in executing it. Um, and uh, uh, so that's, you know, that's the leg locks, knee bar, foot lock, figure four toe hold, heel hook. Um, can't think of any other leg locks that are does, out there that I'm missing. Does the, the in your mind does the heel hook change a bunch with the, out the key, as far as the the danger level and the 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 value of it? Yeah, I think uh, I think in no gi it's much easier to turn. Um, the per, number one, the person is won't be grabbing onto your upper body. If a good heel hook, the person. Uh, uh, has the has the opportunity to slow your roll down by grabbing your back or grabbing your belt or grabbing you know your lapel um, to slow that down. Um, number two, cloth. You know that's one of the things I love about the uniform. It's it's like it, it's almost uh, a catch twenty two of one of my favorite things to say. I say what when people say should I train gi or no gi? I say train both, but definitely train the uniform because it adds a level of friction, a level of resistance. That is comparable to, you know, uh, a, a uh, NFL running back in the off season running with a parachute on, or an Olympic track runner running with a parachute on, or an Olympic swimmer training when they're really hairy, but then shaving the hair off before a competition. Uh, you know, it provides resistance and drag. The uniform does that too, so your technique has to be that much cleaner. Uh, however, with your leg and turning. I mean, your toe can get hung up on their kimono top, their belt, uh, the extra cloth of a pant, and it doesn't matter how quickly you turn, you won't be able to spin out. In no gi, uh, especially with MMA gloves on, it's a lot harder for the person to control your heel. I've seen a lot of people survive heel hook attacks, no gi, uh, but I can, in all the time I've watched heel hooks done with a gi on, the person once the person gets caught, they are done. They either tap or they get hurt. Uh, Tim, you were talking about uh, in leg locks there, where you got to have uh, the training partner, and you both have to have the maturity to uh, uh, make sure you know everybody is, is safe. Another one of the taboos uh, today, I guess we'd say uh, for a better word, but dealing with mat bullies, uh, yeah. people who go you know too hard with new students or seem like they're always hurting somebody. Um, I would just like to get your opinions opinions on that there. Well, uh, I, I approach mat bullies in a couple different ways. First, I measure them. I, I try to figure out what's going on. Is it that they have to win every role? Uh, is that why they're a mat bully? Uh, if so, um, I talked I, 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 I talk to them and I talk to the class about what, what does winning mean? Uh, what does being the, per, the prevailer of every role say? About them, I also look back and and try to make sure that I'm being a good role model because in my classes, in my rolling sessions, I don't have to win every roll. Uh, I don't have to be on top every match. Uh, I get tapped every class uh, intentionally. Uh, I, I put myself in danger. I give myself slack. Uh, you know, I, I, I feed into the games of my students so that they can see how they work. Um, and so I make sure that I'm doing that because the last thing I want is to call somebody a map bully and then have them say, well, I'm just doing what you do. So I think an instructor who has map bullies in the gym needs to look and say, okay, am I being a map bully uh, or am I being a good role model? Uh, because then you can say to a map bully, a blue belt or a purple belt, you can say, you know, hey, man, look. I don't treat you like that, um, you know, and uh, you know that's that's just not the way to, to do things. So if it's because they have to win, you have to teach them what winning means. Uh, getting a tap in the gym that means absolutely nothing. There's no video of it. There's no medal that gets attached to it. Um, you know, it, it means absolutely nothing, and you have to devalue uh, victories in the gym. Uh, uh, and set success on, on a different measure. So what I usually do is if I have somebody that's, I say, hey, you, um, you were rolling really rough over there with uh, Todd. Is everything cool between you and Todd? Oh, yeah, yeah, everything's great with me and Todd. Okay, well, um, you know, I've noticed the last 
you know, 12 times you've rolled with Todd, you've caught him in a Kimura. Um, so the next 12 times you roll with Todd, Kimura can't be the move you use. Um, I want you to go, I'm, I'm, I want you to go outside of your, uh, comfort zone and with Todd, Kimura's off the table. If you tap Todd with a Kimura, you lose. Uh, and so I, re- I steer them in a different direction of what, are, what's the purpose of rolling? I talk a lot at my gym about, uh, purposeful training. Everything we do has to have a purpose. Um, every movement we make needs to be purposeful. Otherwise it's wasted energy. And, um, and sparring is the same way. If, if you're sparring, uh, I, I say that with a real quick, uh, parenthetical that it's okay to have roles where you don't have a strategy, where you just kind of smack hands, bump fists and have fun. But when it's training time, when you're training, you need to have uh, a purpose. And if you're hiding from uh, a weak side of your jiu-jitsu, then your, your jiu-jitsu is going to be weak in an area. Uh, I'm going to give away a secret uh, right now to one of my philo- philosophies. Uh, I spend a lot of time at my gym attack, teaching guys to attack the back and getting really, really good at attacking the back. From every position, we are looking to get to your back. And it's a hard thing to do. It's really, really tough to get people's backs, especially the higher the level you get. But the good news is the more successful you get at the back, the easier it is to beat really, really good guys. Why is that? Well, most really, really good guys are good at defending their back, so ipso facto, they spend very little time defending the back. So if you can get their back, they're in a strange land, a land that's far stranger to them than being the bottom cross side or being inside the closed guard. They're there all the, they're in those positions all the time. But if you can get to their back, they they're not there that often. It's a new it's a new land for them. And so they're unfamiliar, their timing is weaker, their their situational awareness is lower. So you've you've got to be able to get there. And my guys are really tough to submit from the back because we train like that. But if you hide from your weak area, so uh, if you let's say I don't ever want anybody to mount me. So if I do everything I can to prevent people from mounting me and I never let anybody mount me, then that's good until somebody mounts me. And once somebody mounts me, I'm not going to have my timing is going to be poor. My reactions are going to be wrong. My angles aren't going to be right. I'm going to push. I'm going to do something stupid. And the person who's better and who has their mount game dialed in is going to, is going to beat me. So if I find somebody that's only running their A game, I will, as their coach, as their instructor, create a B game that includes a, a weakness. And I'll say, look, if anybody's got a belt that's lighter than your belt, you've got to be in this position with them from the start. And if you get to position X, Y, or Z, you have to, you have to reset. And so I focus their training to try to focus them away from, from being a, a, a dominant fighter because they may not view themselves as a bully. They may just view themselves as being dominant and dominance fa- fine. I want, do- I want, I want the person to be able to dominate when it's necessary. But when it, when the domination turns into a bully, like they're starting to be rough or they're starting to be a jerk, then what I talk to them about is, uh, what jujitsu is. Jujitsu is not about being rough or a jerk. I mean, jujitsu or the art suave or the gentle way. Or the yielding art uh, is about doing the least amount of damage possible to ourselves and to our opponents to to get acquiescence, compliance, or submission. That's that's the philosophy of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. That's why we don't do strikes every day. That's why we're not kicking bags every day and kicking each other in the legs every day and punching uh, with boxing gloves on every day is because strikes in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu are secondary to, you know, uh, closing the distance, clinching, takedown, control, submission. You know, we, because when we hit somebody, we risk hurting ourselves. We risk hurting them. When we kick somebody, we risk hurting ourselves and hurting them. And we want to minimize the risk of hurting ourselves and hurting them. So, uh, if somebody's being a jerk, 
you know, I talk to them about how that's philosophically not good jujitsu. You know, it's not, not good jujitsu if every one of your partners has mat, has gi burn across the bridge of their nose because you're posting an elbow in their eye socket, you know, to dig out the kimura. Uh, you know, it's, uh, we've all rolled with one of those guys. I had a coach that left me with tons of, uh, of gi burns on my face because my defenses were really tight and he had, he was like, well, if you're not going to open up, I'm going to open you up. Um, philosophically, I don't, I don't agree with that. I, I, I want, that's, that's a, that's a machismo thing. That's a thing where, um, uh, ego and masculinity are starting to play into jujitsu and jujitsu isn't about ego and it isn't about masculinity. It's about, can the weaker person prevail over the stronger person? Can the leverage overcome the strength? Um, you know, uh, um, you know, I, as much as I don't like Conor McGregor uh, because of the, the way he runs his mouth, there's some things that he says that I respect. And you know, right after his uh, uh, right after his fight with Aldo, you know, he he put up his mantra that obviously he's been working on, and you know, uh, precision beats power. Uh, he said he said precision yeah, is more important it. more important than power. Timing is more important than speed. And yeah, that was it. And that's exactly what. You know, the drilling that we do at my school is about. It's about building precision and timing. It's not about power and speed. And when somebody's digging their elbow into your eye socket so they can open, so they can get you to lift your elbow and take a Kimura, you know, that's power. Uh, that's not precision. Uh, I always tell people there's no such thing as a perfect move in Jiu Jitsu. There's a way into and out of every single technique. You just have to know where, where to find the leverage point, where to find the loose jank. And so with Matt Bullies, I tell them, I say, I, I, I say to them, look, you aren't uh, using good jujitsu. You, it may be effective, but it's not going to be effective if you were if you were rolling against you. It wouldn't be effective because you wouldn't give up to somebody grinding an elbow into your eye socket. You wouldn't give up, you know, uh, because think about it. And, and most Matt Bullies will say, you know, you're right. And I say, so you need to figure out how to, how you would submit yourself. How would you get yourself to give up? You'd have to use better technique. And then, you know, you know, this comes to another taboo topic of, you know, how do you ask somebody to leave your gym and when yeah. do you ask somebody to leave your gym? Um, and, you know, that's a very, very hard thing for a business owner, uh, especially if you're running a, a jiu-jitsu school and you're trying to make a living. You know, it's hard to get somebody to leave. But uh, one, of, one of the clear things that you have to do is you have to take care of the greater, the greater good. Uh, of your of your team physically and emotionally and uh, the vibes uh, you know uh, nothing brings a, a school down faster than you know somebody who comes in with a negative disrespectful um, uh, aura you know uh, the rules don't apply to them or it's all a bunch of garbage you know, uh, that's a, that's a taint. That's a, uh, that's, that's a sickness that you have to wash from your, your, your tribe. Um, I, I, I say this a lot. Your vibe attracts your tribe, but sometimes people will try to infiltrate and be subversive. Uh, and it's not a matter of, Hey, the guy didn't bow to me before he got on his mat. So he's got to leave the gym. No, it's, 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 the person's coming in and all their, their tone is always negative. They're always, you know, disrespecting sort of the order of class, how things are supposed to go, how it's supposed to look. You know, they're bad mouthing other students or making fun of other students' inabilities or, uh, or, or making light of their abilities. Um, you know, those people, you know, uh, they, they're, they're, they're a poison. You got to figure out when you're going to get rid of them and you got to, you got to execute an appropriate strategy to get rid of them. Uh, I always, I always try to work with people and, and figure out what's what's going on with them. And I've had people who've been kicked out of other schools come train with me and do fine with me. Uh, but it's because my expectations are very, very clear. I won't have X, Y, and Z done in my gym. You're not gonna, you're not gonna spew the F word uh, uh, more than once before I jump down your throat and tell you why we don't do that. 
you're not going to talk badly about my my competition in the area uh, in front of other students before I uh, more than once before I come up to you and I say, look, that's not what we're about right here. You know, I it, as a as a business owner, I, you know, I kind of like to hear that people like my product better than they like the guy down the street. However, it's not the it's not my it's not to happen in my gym on my space because that's negative energy. People are going to associate that negative conversation about somebody else with my mat space, and I don't want that. I want what's going on in my mat space to be positive, to be about improvement, to be about what's quality here. I don't want it to be about oh the guy down the street. All he does is you know he teaches one move and then everybody just you know just spars and you know that's why nobody gets better. Blah 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 blah. Well, I don't want to hear that. I mean, I, I'm like, hey, let's not talk about that. Let's just talk about what we're going to do to get better. And um, if the person's coming in and saying, well, I've trained at this guy's and I've trained at this guy's, he's a real he's a real dirt bag or he or he sleeps with all the all of his female students. Man, I I cut that stuff out right away. I was just like, look. That's nobody's business, you know. Uh, no, nobody here's looking to send their daughter there. I mean, if that, that's a little bit different. But you know, let's not go spreading rumors here. That's that's nothing that needs to be talked about. Uh, and if they don't, if they continue to do that sort of thing, then I I just say, look, it's uh, you know, it's not working out for us. You know, this is uh, here are the things that uh, if you want to stay, here's the things you've got to do to to make it so that you can stay, and and that'll be you know. You can't be talking about that kind of stuff here. But most of the time, if, if it's gotten to the point where I'm thinking about that they need to leave, then I don't really want them uh, having to earn their way back in because uh, they'll start trying to draw people to their side. They'll say, yeah, you know, professor and I are having – you know, we had an argument and he said I could stay if I do this, that, and the other. Isn't that a bunch of crap? You know, don't you think that's a bunch of crap? And – now that now they're trying to gain allies so that when they leave, you know they can, you know they can throw mats in their garage and have people to train with. Uh, it's better if you just when you make the decision to get rid of somebody, you have a very mature adult conversation. Hi, you know, hi Tony. I'm, uh, you know, I've been seeing some stuff that you know uh, that you you've been doing, and not not a real big fan of it. I'm sorry, it's not going to work for us. I'm, I'm canceling your contract, and uh, I want to shake your hand, wish you the best. Uh, hope to see you around. Uh, take care of yourself. Bye. Um, and that, as a business owner, that's really all you owe them. One of the things I do at the outset, so that there's no sort of well, I didn't know, was I have what, uh, a thing called a student eligibility and disciplinary guidelines. And th- that sheet of paper, before anybody signs a contract with my gym, they have to sign that contract with me. Uh, and the the point number one on that is if they're a student in school, they have to be a good citizen at school. They can't they can't they have to get good grades. They can't be a troublemaker. They can't be getting in fights. They can't be uh, uh, they can't get kicked out of school um, uh, before they get a promotion to a, a new belt. Uh, I send their teacher a letter, and their teacher grades them, and then sends me back uh, the grading, and then I see whether or not they're going to get their 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 belt promotion. Uh, you know, so my youth students from the get-go find out that I care about what's going on at school. Uh, I read that to the adults as well because I want them to see that citizenship starts young and it's something that I value. Uh, number two on my eligibility and disciplinary guidelines is uh, they can't be convicted of a crime against society. Um, so, you know, we, we talk about, you know, not being convicted of, you know, rape. Murder, uh, burglary, armed robbery, uh, you know, cr- uh, things like, uh, you know, heavy, heavy duty stuff, you know, like big stuff that shows that you're, 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 you've got a problem with sort of dealing with people. Now, everybody has past problems that they can, they can show that they've cleaned up their life with, and that's fine, but, uh, if, if somebody gets, uh, uh, charged with that kind of stuff, and they're one of my students. Then they they need to understand that their contract is going to be terminated until all of that gets resolved, uh, and they probably won't be welcome. Uh, we talk about, you know, I have uh, I have a clear thing in there about language, uh, uh, sexist jokes, um, you know, things that aren't family appropriate behavior. I have a thing in there about uh, race, uh, race, racist and discriminatory 
conduct is is absolutely zero tolerance. Uh, I have people from all different makes and models that come into my gym, uh, uh, and we don't have. I have zero tolerance for it. I don't care what your political viewpoints, religious viewpoints are. Um, you know, I have I have my own, and uh, my gym is not a place for that to be um, uh, discussed or hashed out or. Um, Argued over, it, it is what it is, and uh, and racism's got to go. There's there's just no no place for that. That's not what we're about. And so when, so if any one of those things comes up, the person's not going to be able to look at me and say, "Oh, I didn't know I wasn't allowed to use that that racial slur here." You know, I mean, heck, I'm this guy, and or I'm allowed to use this racial slur because I'm that or I'm this, and you know, it's no big deal. It's not a hard no. You sign that piece of paper that said it's it's zero tolerance. Thank you very much. Have a great day. You can go down the road. Maybe somebody else will have you. But um, so I think it's good for a school owner to you know sort of set some written gu- guidelines out early. Uh, that way, when you get the guy you need to kick out, it's it's not a big process of I got to give them due process and let them have another shot. Nah, if you need to get rid of somebody, get rid of them because um, oh, I, my kindergarten teacher said you know it only takes one apple to spoil the barrel. Uh, and you know, you don't want, you don't want to let that bad apple, uh, you know, just continue to putrefy in, inside your gym. Um, I've watched, um, um, one of the most, uh, compassionate and giving people in the world, Professor Andre, I've watched him have to kick a person out of his gym, a person who had titles, uh, was, uh, a decorated grappler who would have been positive for the team in the standpoint of winning points on um, on the board, uh, yeah, uh, but the person was coming to class intoxicated on 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 a controlled substance, and you know there uh, there's just you have to protect your students. Yeah, you um, you know there there may be a, a belief that people can train high and not. Uh, and it makes them a better grappler, but there's also sort of clear evidence out there that uh, you lose ability to control certain motor functions as well as you would if you were sober. Um, and you've got to take care of your your student body, and you got to take care of your culture. At my gym, I have a rule: you can't come into class ha- uh, drunk or stoned. Uh, I don't. I don't. I'm not going to get into what you're doing at home. It's none of my not really in my business, but you know, if I if I smell weed on you uh, and you appear to be high, I'm gonna I'm gonna we're gonna have a problem, uh, and that's because I care about the safety of of the every student. And if somebody disrespects that after be, being told that rule cleanly up front, then they, they 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 don't respect the instructor, they don't respect the school, they don't respect the people involved, and. Uh, that's a, a a good a good indication that they need to go, and you just got to get rid of them. Well, it, you've got a lot of different things that that you have uh, parameters for, but you have uh, your expectations are clear, and uh, I think that probably helps out and makes it a little more easy. Yeah, the tough where, where it gets tough, uh, Byron is is when. If you, the, the more organized and, struct, and structured you set up your program from the beginning, the easier it is. When you have a, a, a gym that's run by buddies and it's, it, it starts out as a club and then forms into sort of an organized business, that's where I see people really struggle. Uh, you know, because maybe one of the guys that's a buddy that runs this gym, he might be, you know, a foul mouth. And the other guy's a really clean guy. And the, and the clean guy is the guy that's in charge of running the kids program, of course. And then the foul mouth is the guy that might be running the, the, you know, the beginner adult program and those two programs collide and you've got foul mouth running an F, dropping F bombs and he's got students in there that are in the locker room who are, who are just mimicking their coach's language, yeah. uh, while the kids are finishing up and that uh, versus sort of at the, at the get go, you say, uh, look, we're running a business. This business has to be family friendly. As a family friendly business, business, we have to have a culture of cleanliness, uh, not only uh, physical but uh, verbal cleanliness. And uh, you know, so I, I think the, the clearer the expectations of everybody at the outset, the less trouble and drama you have given somebody the boot. Man, I just want to tell you, Tim, that 
you know, especially that last part that we were just talking about, your expectations. I tell you, for anybody, you know, I didn't really know it was going to go that way, but I'm sitting there thinking, for anybody that runs a school, that was such good advice. And it's stuff, to be honest, not that I run a school, but I've never thought about that stuff. And, uh, and you know, I never even thought about, you know, the, the law aspects, uh, uh, you know, sexual harassment, all that. And, and I see it happen a lot of times in gyms and never really, you know, thought about uh thought about it and uh you know from a from a gym owner standpoint and you know liability and everything and uh, i i just thought that whoever's listening to this episode that owns a gym just got some incredible advice thank you i uh, uh i'm glad i could help i hope that i hope that you know uh as we talked about before the interview began is you know i i hope that something in here uh was of value to at least one person, uh, if it, if it's one little point in each little topic that we covered, you know, um, you know, I've spent a lot of time thinking about each one of these things, and you know, as a as an attorney, I can I can play both sides of the fence, but the opinions that I've given, I would be I would I would go have dinner with anybody and uh, and feel comfortable that I that I'm able to advocate. So. Um, uh, I hope it's good advice. I hope it's uh, that people find it valuable. Um, you know, my uh, my email uh, is available to people if they if they want to ask me questions or or sort of if they want a sample of what an eligibility and disciplinary guidelines can can contain in it. I'd, I'd love to help people because it, it you know it's a huge selling factor for me when 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 kids sign up. You know, and the parents are getting ready to sign the contract. I say, hold on, I need to talk to uh, little Jimmy first. And they're like, what? I was like, yeah. And so little Jimmy comes in. I said, hey, your parents are about ready to sign you up to be my student. And before I'm going to take any money from them, you've got to agree with me on some things. And I go through school with them. I go through what it means to not be uh, a criminal. I said, and because look, my adults can't be criminals and neither can you. You can't be doing things that you can't be throwing rocks at cars and doing stupid stuff like that. You know, I talked about what racism and discrimination are and say that's not going to be tolerated here. You know, I go through each one of those. It's the same exact sheet for kids as it is for adults. And the parents love it because it's just another opportunity for them to see that I care about their child above and beyond, you know, signing them up for, for class. It's a, it's a, it's about, Building better people, building champions of life. That's the key right there. Building better people, building champions of life. And, and that's what it's all about. Yeah, and I agree. Just great advice. Great. Thank you so much, guys, for having me on. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. We, we really appreciate it. You taking your time out. Yeah. Thanks for sharing your insight. Great. I look for feedback. I can't wait. Well, that was an awesome interview there. Uh, part two with Tim Sled on jujitsu taboos. Um, it's kind of neat, some of the topics we hit on today, but I'll tell you the one I really like and you know I do get a kick out of in today's era is the fake black belt. Uh, I don't know if uh, some of you guys check out the website, The Underground. Um, they've got some guys there who are great at outing fake black belts, but today with, with, with the internet, um, podcasts like this, um, it, it's so hard to pull that over on people uh, you know here you are your your martial arts is supposed to you know be about a uh, you know protecting yourselves code of honor and here you are lying to people um so that was a uh, you know something that i really uh really like talking to tim about right there about the outing a fake black belt yeah i questioned that like tim said that how mentally together are you if you think this is a good idea like People, if I go around saying I'm a world class kickboxer, I'm gonna get dist- I'm gonna get beat up all the time, like yeah, and justifiably yeah. so. Like people would go hard against me. I don't know anything about kickboxing. <laughs> I'm gonna get my <laughs> nose broken like nine times in a thirty minute period. So, I, I think probably more than that, bar. Probably more than that. After yeah, a while, it's kind of mush. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, it's just a terrible idea to, to to say something like that where the consequences are physical. Like, it's one thing to say, yeah, I'm a spelling bee champion and go out there and spell terribly. Well, nobody chokes me or armbar me or, you know, put a lot of pressure on me. 
punch me in the face, whatever. I went out there and I was terrible at spelling and I embarrassed myself, whatever. But jujitsu, people are going to roll hard with you with that black belt around your waist. You know, be ready for it. And I'm sure you are ready for it because you have a lot of time and, and experience on the mat. If you're faking that, uh, you're in for a bad time, my friend. Well, I think, though, a lot of people who fake it probably don't really get on the mat either, except in the beginner's class, I, I would assume. Yeah. Uh, if if I knew I didn't have that skill and I was telling you how great I am that I'm a world champion in jiu-jitsu and I get on the mat with, you know, let's say Tim Sled, I d- I know I'm going to be outed right then and there. Yeah. I need to, uh, you know, fake an injury, um, you know, call in sick that day. I, I, I think probably a lot of them don't get out there, but the bad thing is the people who can talk really well don't get out there. So you can't really see, you know, a lot of these guys have established gyms. Um, you can't really see their skill level. It may take a little while till, till they're outed, but you're, you're trusting this person to teach your, teach your kid, teach yourself, um, really what kind of training are you getting? Are you wasting your money? Yeah. And then on top of that, like, you know, Tim was talking about, you were talking about the, the mental aspects of that person. I mean, would you want to leave, let's say your kid, would you want to leave your kid at that school and, and leave? Like you'd want to be supervising it's, uh, with somebody who's, you know, shows they have no honor, no code. Yeah. And it, like, you don't have to have a black belt to teach jujitsu. Like no, Gary and I no. started with the pro belt and it was good instruction and we learned a lot. Right, Gary? Yeah. yeah we learned a lot. It, it's just the idea that like, you're paying for black belt services, I think, is part of the problem. And then somebody who's willing to lie to you, like, That's the key. flat out. Somebody who is willing to lie to you. Somebody who will lie to you. Like you said, there's there's great – I've seen great instruction from blue belts. Um, there's – but this person's lying. That's what it's all about. This person is, is pulling the wool over your eyes. This person can't even be honest about himself. He should never be in charge of a gym. You yeah. think about any business that's not honest. I mean, they go out of business, right? They they're not going to survive if if you're a jujitsu school and you're being dishonest. You you're not going to survive. Yeah, and here's another part of this fake black belt stuff. Um, if you're a white belt and even some blue belts, like rolling with a purple belt versus a rolling with a black belt, can seem very similar. The purple yeah. belt could, and sometimes in a rest of purple belt will just be a lot harder of a roll than the black belt who's just kind of being playful and and you know like it's it's. It can be very difficult to tell until you see that purple belt roll with a brown belt. And like, oh, he's getting well, beat a lot worse than, than I anticipated. Well, how about the poor white belt who started at this school and is trained there a couple of years, gets promoted to, to blue, gets promoted to purple. Then all of a sudden their guy gets outed. He has to go to a new school. I mean, really, you're, there's a good chance you're back to a white belt. You, you've wasted all that time. You yeah. put all that money into it. And really, what did you learn? I, mean, I Gary – I don't know what they learned, but I would say that, I mean, the time that you spent, if that's the only training you had available, that's what you had to do. It's and better it, than it, nothing. It, it's painful. Well, I would imagine it's painful to lose your belts because you were promoted yeah. by a fake black belt. But you still were on the mat trying to learn, trying to get better. Um, don't be too discouraged by that. And just yeah, don't start be, keep, where you keep are. Keep training. But the bad thing is I, I think some people might just get frustrated and just quit. They're, Absolutely. You think about it. You, you go to a restaurant and it's not what it is or you get terrible service. You don't go back to that restaurant. It's, you may just stop eating chicken if you get, uh, you know, food poisoning or whatever. But I just don't want somebody to, to put their couple years in all of a sudden, you know, get demoted belt wise when they go to a real school and get so frustrated with jujitsu because of some scumbag, you know, sorry for using that language, but some scumbag <laughs> who, <Ooh. laughs> who, <laughs> no, I mean, I try to, yeah, 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 yeah. you're yeah, describing a person, so but, that's, what. yeah, some, somebody dishonest person who has ruined your, your take on jujitsu. I don't want somebody to just get so upset that they, they quit. They, you know, they've had, they dealt with some dishonest scumbag and they don't want to train anymore. You know, <laughs> Hey, it, it's better than nothing. At least you're out there training. We were talking about the article. You were losing weight. You were, you know, getting your heart rate up there. You know, there was a lot of good at that. And you did learn stuff. And you just may have to take a step backwards, but we have to do that in life all the time. Yeah. You may take a step backwards in a new school, but boy, you're going to get there. You're going to get there in short time with the right instruction. Gary. So if that happens to you, just, just jump back on that horse and uh, find yourself a very qualified school. You're on to something, Gary, about this. 
that, that that might be the most damaging part of the fake black belt is is the damage done to their students. Um, yes. yep. It's it's that's significant, you know. And and when let's just say you've trained for two years and your your teacher got outed and they 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 weren't even like a very good white belt. And uh, and, and and where do you go from there? Well, yeah. and and us as let's say there was another gym across town, or we need to as Brazilian Jiu Jitsu teachers and students, we need to welcome these guys with open arms. And not they got scammed. Yeah, it, they they're not part of it. They got scammed. Don't look at them and say, "Oh, that guy's from that school. They're terrible." Open your arms to these people. Say, "Hey, come on over to this school. We'd love to have you as as teammates." You know, we uh, we train hard. We'll teach you. You know, afterwards, we'd like to go out to Buffalo Wild Wings and hang out and watch UFC. We're we're a family. We'd love to have you part of our group. And uh, you know, welcome them. Put open your arms. Let them in. Let's be good. Uh, Good people, yeah, and the, and there's no, I mean they they just got tricked. I mean that's it could happen to anybody, and and maybe they didn't listen to chapter one about finding the right gym for them in the in the audio book there. Uh, yeah, so they need to check the <laughs> audio book out. But uh, it happens to anybody. I mean, it, the person could have been charismatic and could have been you know very confident, and and uh, people get scammed. I mean that's that's yeah. it's unfortunate, but that's reality. And some of these people are going to be uh, doing jujitsu, and people who are not who they say they are, um, and. If it's you, own it. Yeah, I, I trained here. I, it was a mistake, and, and I didn't really learn much. Uh, I, I like jujitsu, and I want to keep training. I'm interested in this place now, and uh, keep going. You know, it's just part of your, a little bit of part of your story, kind of like a little asterisk on what on your training. Yeah, I've trained for two years, and you know, questionable how much I got out of those first two, but here I am. I'm training today, and I'm from the future, I will be training hard, and I'll be training here or somewhere yeah. of this similar quality. So. Yep, and I've got goals for myself, and and I'm going to get there. I'm going to keep keep staying on the mat. I'm going to when I'm injured, I'm going to keep going to practice and watching. I'm going to check videos out online. I'm going to read books. I'm going to keep my mind sharp. I'm always going to keep training. Yeah, I'm going to get there. The uh, the mat bullies, you know, that is one that kind of stood stands out to me. That's been one of the like I don't get upset very often, but when I see somebody rolling too hard with somebody who can't really deal with it you know a lot of times a kid or or just somebody who's new and they're just getting destroyed i get i get a little bit worked up sometimes like yeah, what are you doing and, to this person like there's no point yeah and you know a guy made a good point to me i was talking about a guy that came in and rolled too hard and you know he was rolling hard and and i i made a comment that hey i made sure i took him next and you know i just throttled him and you know this guy just looks at me and he's he's like hey did you talk to him first and man, I, I felt, you know, like two feet tall. I mean, this was a brand new guy, first day that he had trained with us, and, you know, was going hard. And, you know, I, I never thought about that. I just like, yeah, I'm just going to go calm him down just by going, I'm, I'm going to turn the heat up on him, and I'm going to, a lot of times we can calm somebody down just by, you know, throttling him, you know, going hard and uh, teaching him his boss. But, in all reality, I was like, wouldn't it have been better when that guy told me? Shouldn't I just said, hey, do you realize maybe you're going a little bit too hard? And I know a lot of times people don't want to have that talk. It's kind of uncomfortable talk. But I think I probably should have talked to him first. And the bad thing is he doesn't train anymore. And maybe it's because of that day that uh, I went a little too hard. He's, I know him personally as a professional. He's a good guy. And Maybe I maybe I messed up, and he's not training now. And there's a chance it could have been because of me. Gary, that's I appreciate you sharing that story, and uh, it's always good to hear like personal. Um, it's it's like you're owning what happened, you know, like you're taking responsibility yeah. for that, and uh, that's that's nice of you. And we all make mistakes. Um, yeah. I know I've I've gone hard against people who um, probably, although it looked like they deserve it, that probably wasn't the right thing to do. And uh, it's just so – it's jujitsu is so easy that, you know, you see somebody being a jerk, you could go beat them up. <laughs> yeah. Like well, it's, it's nice. Kinda, you know, we are talking about the culture of belt whipping. It's kind of too We kind of have a culture of, uh, you know, we police ourselves. Uh, yeah. But I think – I just think that I made one mistake just by not talking first. Yeah. And, you know, I, in that group that we were training with, I was the most experienced person. And I, I that should have been my job to do that. And instead of doing that, I, I, I went one step farther. And the bad thing is, I don't know if he's not training because of that. And maybe, I mean, just talking about this, I mean, I'll see him next week. I, I think I might just talk to him. 
And, uh, you know, who knows? I, I'm really feeling bad about it the more I'm talking about it. Yeah. Well, you're, uh, you haven't, you have a conscious Gary. That's nice. I, I would kind of the way I've done things when I felt like I've done them right. And I've, I've definitely got animated with some people and, and it, one that's coming to mind is somebody rolling really hard with a child and, and, and trying to get them, not like a child, but like a junior high, early high school kid and, and really yeah. trying to tap them out because they can't tap out anybody else and, and like potentially injuring this, the, the younger person. I got pretty mad and, and it, uh, you know, I stopped it from rolling, and and I was like, "Why are you? What's wrong with you? Why are you trying yeah. to murder this other your teammate here? Like, this is not how we're doing." You know, and I'm sure that person got some hard rolls from me. But uh, the better way I've I've done things is, is tell them, "Hey, okay, this person is here to train you. So they're not going to try to be in the UFC next week. Um, they're just trying to get a little bit better. You're going really hard with them. If you want to roll hard, here's a list of people who you could roll as hard as you want to with, and I don't have any problem with that at all. And I'm on the list, and so are a lot of other people. If you just want to go around trying to smash people, these people are going to roll hard with you. If you want to train and, and learn and slow things down a little bit, they'll be happy to help you get better technically. But uh, and, and I have several students today that will ask me, um, was I going too hard? And I'll say no. Like I don't have anybody who I, don't, who I want them to dial back all the time. I'll say, no, if you want to go hard with me, that's fine. It, you know, sometimes I see you going too hard with somebody else. That's that's where the issue is, you know. I always tell Byron, you know, hey, I don't want you rolling too hard with me. And then as soon as he slows down, I turn it up. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, appreciate you guys helping get the word out of the podcast here. One way you could do that is write us a review on iTunes. If you live in the United States, send us an email at bjjbrick at gmail.com, and we'll send you out a gee patch um, for your efforts there. And uh, – that's pretty easy. If you don't live in the United States, you still would like to write a review. We really appreciate that as well. It's just a way to help promote the podcast and let iTunes know that it's a decent show. Um, another way that we really love you guys for running the show is tell a friend about it. It means a lot to us and, and that the people are willing to say, hey, you know, you, I know you have friends at Jiu Jitsu. If you want to tell a couple of them, hey, you know, listen to the podcast, bjjbrick.com or, or check, find it on iTunes. Um, it really helps get the word out about the show and, and it will help your training partners. Hopefully you've get, got something out of this show to where you actually can train a little bit smarter or better or learn about some taboo topics and have gains from this and uh, your teammates will as well. So, And if you'd like to get more uh, BJJ brick or or just you know check out the old episodes or anything, we're on social media, we're on YouTube. Uh, we, hold, we have all of our uh, episodes there on YouTube. We are uh, on uh, Instagram. Facebook, um, and as Byron said earlier, email is uh, bjjbrick at gmail.com. Yeah. Next week's show is going to be great. Justin Raider. Everybody knows who Justin Raider is, so, uh, one of the one of the best jiu-jitsu guys in, uh, in the United States. And, and uh, Byron and I were lucky enough to uh, uh, attend a seminar by Justin Raider. And, and if I remember correctly, I remember Justin said it was his first seminar. Um, does that sound right, Byron? I don't I remember. It, it, it seemed like he was seminar. like a professional seminar uh, yeah. person, but uh, it but was Byron very good. Byron and I were talking also afterwards. Like the guy's got more passion for jujitsu than anybody I've ever seen in my life, and and I just remember saying, if he wasn't in jujitsu, he could easily be a motivational speaker. I mean, he, uh, I tell you, I, I left that seminar, you know, with a smile on my face and and just in a great mood, uh, just excited about life basically so uh not only is he a, a great jiu-jitsu guy man he's just a just a great person uh you can cheer anybody up he's uh, one of the most positive people i've ever met in my life yep and we've got him next week so that's uh, something to look forward to and to bring that positivity and and uh world-class jiu-jitsu and and amazing no-gi uh, competitor he's doing mma as well so um a lot going on with Justin Raider, and we'll catch up with him. It's been a while since we've had contact with Justin, so it's good to get him back on the show. Get him on the show. He's never been on the show, so uh, we've, like Gary said, we've met him before. But uh, yeah, I was gonna say we've uh, had uh, his teammates, uh, his coach Rafael Lovato. We've had uh, Jared Dopp. We've had uh, uh, Dallas Niles. So uh, we've had a lot of his uh, training partners on and teammates. Yep. So a good one to add to the list of uh, Lovato athletes. Gary, and you, James Popolo. Yes, indeed. We've had him too. <laughs> we should not forget. Gary, we've had, um, we talked a little bit about the audiobook that I made. 
Um, we've kind of alluded to a little bit about your audio book that you may not I have realized. I you were going to forget. No. I can't. I wrote a little note that I won't forget. I, um, I have to put you on the spot every week. I need to put you in this pressure point and get you I to. I appreciate those pressure points. Yes. <laughs> they may not work so well in just two, but they work good on audio books. That's what counts. <laughs> Uh, your audiobook this week that you're working on, and I know you're coming to a, a, like your knowledge in this area is so vast. I'm just amazed, but it's called The Sharpened Spoon. Anything can become a weapon. So. Yes, and as you guys probably heard earlier in the podcast, I mean, I, I, I consider myself a black belt in shanks, uh, sharpened spoons, but what we're gonna do in this audiobook is, you know, we got sporks, <laughs> I mean, spoons, forks, I mean, we've got everything, but it's gonna, this audiobook is gonna teach you how to use regular kitchen utensils in everyday aspects of self-defense or, you know, when the zombie apocalypse comes. So, you'll be prepared and you don't need anything more than what you have in one of your kitchen drawers. So, uh, it's gonna be very informative and, uh, and it's gonna, I mean, like I said earlier, it'll teach you, you know, how to, uh, how to survive and uh, with with little more kitchen utensils. I mean, egg beaters are a little bit rougher, but um, we're mostly going to focus on spoons, forks, and sporks. There we go. And the spork yeah. is a vastly underutilized tool in this yeah. area. Yeah, and I mean, we'll even one of the chapters is on norks, <laughs> a knife and fork. Ah. Else, so, yeah, so definitely that's chapter four. So I don't miss the nork chapter. A lot of combinations of stuff going on here, Gary. Yep, yep. So, awesome, awesome audiobook, and this is one I uh, poured my, you know, heart and soul into. The combination of the knife and spoon is just a shank, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Shank you. Gary, this reminds me of a wedding gift I was given. Um, I guess me and my wife were given when we got married. Somebody Switch gave <laughs> a kitchen utensil, and oh, okay. uh, it was it was a rolling pin, like uh, for pastry, you know, like a wooden rolling pin. Oh yeah. And taped to it, I mean, it wasn't like a like a wrapped gift. It was kind of a uh, one, a, a, a uh, kind of a honorary friend gave it to us, I would say. And it taped to the gift. It said uh, taped to this rolling pin. It said you could feed him or beat him. And uh, and it's true, she could feed me with this rolling pin or beat me with this rolling pin. But guess what? Is she that why it? I see bruises all the time <laughs> on your arms and back? No, that's not the or reason. Or is that from belt whipping? That's. <laughs> <laughs> guess what she did? What? She returned it to the store. <laughs> well, she did, look at that. Way. We have a rolling pin. She returned it to the store and got some money, so she could feed you. Oh man, that's right. Man, I'm Byron, such a lucky man. You are one lucky man. To have a friend like me. <laughs> <laughs> giving me uh, rolling pins as gifts. No, Gary did not give me that gift, I, have, I believe. I think I remember who did. No, I was just saying Byron's lucky a man to have a friend like me. That's that true. Has to do with rolling pins. That's true. I am lucky for all my friends, and Gary's definitely on the top of the list uh, every week podcasting I'm with never, me. Yeah. Yep. So. Anyway, before we get too uh, cheesy over here, uh, Gary's audiobook will be produced shortly. Uh, look for it. It'll be in the cooking book section um, yep. instead of the self-defense. He's going that weird route. I think there's less there's less area, uh, less competition there for cooking books in self de- you know for how to fight there than there is in the self-defense area. So. And if you've watched some, pre- some of our previous episodes, it's going to come out on May 33rd. Yeah, it's going to be that's going to be a big day. R. Yep. R. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> I uh, hope somebody gets that joke, but uh, <laughs> we'll leave it there on the table. We will catch you guys next week, and as always, stay sweaty, my friends. And don't forget to shower, and if you are in the shower, make sure it has a drain in there in case you decide to shank somebody <laughs> that you can throw the, the handle under in the shower drain. <laughs> that was awesome, Terry. <laughs> Very detailed. Thank you for listening. I hope you find the time today to roll. After all, The best way to get better at Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is to do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. You must take personal responsibility. You cannot change the circumstances, the seasons, or the wind. But you can change yourself. That is something you have charge of. Um, That's just saying that um, you can't... There's so much in life you can't change and you can't alter but you can change what you do you could uh, you're you're in total control of that 
Um, so take responsibility for that and, uh, and go forward and, and think about that with jujitsu with these taboo topics that, that might help you, help you kind of stay motivated to that. If you feel strongly about one of these and, uh, and you want to act, you probably should. And I got, you know, the, the one thing I thought about is, uh, you cannot change the circumstances, the seasons or the wind. I would like to say that to some of the, the climate change people and, you know, I have an argument about that because I would say the climate change people would say you can change the seasons, you can change the wind. <laughs> Skip that part. <laughs> Hold on. That's, uh, that's, that's, uh, it's interesting, Gary, and I guess uh, maybe not one person, but as a whole, we could change the, uh, we could take this uh, a little bit bigger, Gary, because as a community, as a, as a global thing going on, we can change things like that, you know, and same thing in, in the jiu-jitsu world. As a community, we could decide something is wrong. Um, you know, maybe we have, uh, it, it's becoming normal for kids to, to jump into MMA and do that. Well, um, as a community, we could kind of like, well, maybe we shouldn't be having, having our kids that are yellow belts start to do MMA. Like, to, and, and as a community, we kind of just, uh, kick, kick that out of our sport to where it doesn't happen as often, you know? Um, like changing the climate as a community of people. <laughs> Man, that was good. Yeah, not really. He, he, <laughs> I'm just twisting words around and making them uh, relate back to, to each other, I guess, Gary. Hey, I say we start that all over again. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we must. I must. Well, I had my uh, – right, you said that my microphone fell off the dang table, no. and I'm trying to pick it up. <laughs> no, you did good, and I messed okay, it up. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll just – how about we just start from where I read it? Okay, yep. <clears throat> 